Grab your Bible <laughs> and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And I'm starting a new series of messages um, that I'm calling Kingdom Cause. Kingdom Cause. You can see it right there. Kingdom Cause cause. And I, I like to teach in series. I mean, why, why do you do series? Um, because I, I, it just helps me cover the subject well and to hit it from different angles. And also people are in and out different weeks. You're here different weeks. Maybe you're not here. Maybe you're online one week, maybe you're in person, whatever it is. And this just helps us all to stay together. But I want to do this series on, on the kingdom of God. And I know when you say kingdom, it's like, I don't know, are we going game of Thrones or is this like old King James version kind of church or what? What is it? And it's really neither. It's neither uh, because don't let that word fool you because that word is, I think, what brings clarity to life. And so I'm going to tell you in this series, I'm going to give you the meaning of life. I'm going to tell you how to be successful in life. I'm going to tell you how to win, 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 no matter what. (laughs) Right? And so now I'm not going to to do that today. No, it's all right. And so I already snuck one in at the end of worship. I grabbed a mic and sung a little bit. And even though I'm not on worship team, I hijacked it. Anyways, um, but no, no, no. Win, win, win. We're going to win. And so in Matthew chapter 6, this is the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Most people understand Jesus. It's the longest message Jesus, uh, or the the longest dissertation of Jesus we have in, in the Gospels, in Scripture, is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He's on the Mount of Beatitudes which is the northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee, just kind of northwest of Capernaum up on this hill. And he starts teaching. And in Matthew chapter six, we have one of the most famous verses in Christianity. And I want to take that verse and I'm going to talk about that verse for several weeks uh, because I think there's a lot in it that I think we miss. And I'm even going to talk about why we miss what's actually in it. And so if you, if you want to go with me, if you can, if you have a Bible there at home, hey, make sure put kingdom cause in the chat. You get tuned in, get locked in, locked and loaded. Here we go. Grab your Bible. Get your, we used to say old, old school church, get your sword out. Because the Bible is the sword of the spirit. Get your sword out. And Matthew 6 Verse 25, it says, now, therefore, I will tell you, do not worry about your life. So Jesus is about to tell us how to live a worry free life. How many are good at worrying? Yes, my people. I'm a professional. I can worry about things you don't even know to worry about. I have a gene. It comes from my maternal grandmother. I never will forget the first time I told my, my, my grandmother's in heaven, granny, I mean, granny and pop. And so it's my mom's parents. And I remember the first time I decided to go on a mission trip, I was going to the Philippines. And I told granny, which you shouldn't have. Because my grandmother, who was a pastor's wife, who loved the Lord, served God her whole life, looked at me and said, honey, you don't need to go to the Philippines. It's dangerous, honey. You may never come back. What if the plane crashes? What if they kidnap you? And she went through the list of everything could possibly go wrong. And then she told me, she said, honey, this is why we pay missionaries. I can hear now. Oh, good Lord. Oh, good grief. That was her. She had a lot. And bless your heart. Bless your heart. That was her. She was that generation. Bless their heart, which was not always a nice thing. It it sometimes meant they they don't have their stuff together. You know what I'm saying? Or, you know. Anyways, she was, yeah. But, but here's what Jesus says. Don't worry about your life. And then, and then he defines where this could start. What you're going to eat or drink or your body, what you'll wear is not life more than food in the body, more than clothes. So he's, now he's talking about something higher beyond physiological need. And this is, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. And are you not much more valuable than they? I just, I want to say this to to the camera, to everyone in the room. You're valuable to God. You are valuable to God. Um, And and if you're wondering how valuable, um, 
then you look at the price he was willing to pay for you. The price paid determines the value. Cost determines value. And he was willing to put his son to death for you. You're valuable. And so I just, I just want, somebody just needs to hear that today. You're valuable to him. And he says, can anyone by worrying add a single hour to your life? Where are my warriors at? Where am I? Okay, here's Jesus' question. How's that working for you? Right, how's it working? How many got up this morning worrying about something? Yeah, yeah. How's it working for you? Yeah, it's not, not working. Verse 28, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? But they don't labor or spend. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, the wealth, most wealthy man in the world, in history, really, in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the, the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. So don't worry about a thing because every little thing is going to be all right. Man, that's pretty much what he says. So don't worry about a thing. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. Verse 32, for, for the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows that you have need of them. Amen. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, don't worry about Monday. For Monday can just worry about itself today. Because every day has enough trouble all of its own. <laughs> no truer words, Jesus, right there. Don't worry about a thing, but seek the kingdom of God. So today, I, I call this message the kingdom solution. Kingdom solution. Kingdom solution. That's what Jesus gives us here. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. And God, I ask that you would come now. And God, we just open our hearts and we say, fill us up. Speak. Pour your word into the soil of our heart and God help us to receive it, to hear it, to take it in. And God, we pray that it would transform our lives in the way that you desire it to. In Jesus name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Don't worry about a thing. I think, I really think Matthew 633 for me has over the last, I don't know, few years, has become like the, it's like the secret sauce of how to make life work. It is. I mean, it's, it's better than what they put on a Big Mac, the secret sauce. It's better than Chick-fil-A sauce. And guys, that stuff right there is manufactured by baby angels. Because you can put Chick-fil-A sauce on everything. And it will make it better. Hallelujah. And, um, and, and I think this is the secret sauce to life. And a lot of people, when you hear kingdom or something like that, it starts sounding maybe religious, antiquated, but I want to encourage you. Let's press, let's press past kind of those old understandings. Let's dive in together because I think Jesus right here is talking about the keys. Like, don't worry about life. I'm going to tell you how to win at life. And, and when you think about the things that he's talking about, don't worry about, let's look at what he's talking about. Don't worry about food. Yeah. Now, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. That seems pretty, maybe it's because I'm a big guy, but that seems pretty important to me. <laughs> like without food, you got about 40 days and then this world's without you. <laughs> right? And then he's like, and don't worry about what you're drinking. I don't, I don't know about you, but hydration's somewhat important to me. This, these do not seem like they are luxurious things. I mean, it's not like he's saying, don't worry about a yacht. Okay, I'm with you, Jesus. <laughs> All right, don't worry about a, a house on the beach in Malibu. Oh, okay, Jesus, I, I, you're right. I shouldn't be worried about that. I should be pinning that on Pinterest. <laughs> no, he's like, don't worry about clothes. But I need them. <laughs> I need clothes. This sermon would be really, really awkward today if I didn't have clothes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that, Jesus. That's not going to work for anybody. You're more thankful than me that I've got clothes. Amen. And so he is sitting here and he is talking about what seems to be basic needs. In fact, if you remember a, an American psychiatrist by the name of Abraham Maslow, 
Jesus is speaking to, to Abraham Maslow developed the hierarchy of human need. And Jesus is speaking to the very basic, the first, the first level of human need, which is physiological need. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. And in Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it was these physiological needs. And then these security needs, like I need money, I need job, I need a place to live, that kind of stuff. And then there was belonging needs. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to belong somewhere. Um, and then there was esteem needs, meaning I'm supposed to be somebody. And then there was self-actualization needs, which means I'm supposed to do something. And what Abraham Maslow actually said was you, you, that these, these levels of need have to be met in order because it, until you meet level one, basic physiological needs, you can't move on to level two, like the needs of security. Until you have the needs of security, then you can't move on to, to the question of where do I belong? And without belonging, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And, and if I don't know what I'm supposed to do, or if I don't get to that level of esteem, then I don't know self actual. I don't know my purpose. And isn't it interesting? Jesus then in Matthew 6.33 says, what you going to eat? I'm going to meet these needs in order. And the answer and the solution for all human need is found in this word, kingdom. Amen. And so that's, that's what I want to talk about today. And I'm, we're going to put it all together. It's going to be awesome. You're going to love it. You'll be glad you were here. You'll be glad you're watching online. Put Online, just put one of those raised hand emojis. Like, I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I'm here right here. I'm glad I'm here. Write this down. Three things. First thing is this, when we look at Matthew 6, Matthew 6, 33, this is the first thing we learn is that earth does not work apart from heaven. Amen. Earth does not work without heaven. When you look at the Bible and you study the Bible, what you see are you see, you see two realms that the Bible identifies. It is the realm of the heavenlies or heaven, right? This seemingly spiritual realm. And that's what it is. And then you see this physical realm called earth. And so in the Bible, what you see is you see this all powerful creator, this king, this God who identifies himself as king, and he exists, he is spirit, he exists in this realm, the realm of heaven. And then in Genesis chapter one, from this spiritual realm of heaven, he begins creating a physical realm known as earth. That the kingdom, the heavenlies, if you will, they're eternal. In fact, you can see this in Daniel chapter four. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, right? And so the kingdom existed before earth. And earth was actually to be a representation of heaven. In fact, this is what he told us to pray. On earth as it is in heaven. God, what are you trying to do? On earth as it is in heaven. And so what, what you see then is God's original plan was that he ruled perfectly over this realm of heaven, this spiritual realm. He had dominion, authority, and power. And he decided, I want to expand this dominion and this rule that I have that exists over the realm of heaven. I want to expand it over a territory that's physical called earth. And I want, to, I want to have dominion and power and rule over earth. And I want earth to bear the image of heaven and to be a re, re, representation, a re-representation, I guess that's a representation to represent heaven. I want earth to look like heaven. Now, if you're sitting here and you're struggling with this and you're, your brain, you're like, wait a second, I don't think it's God. Like, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. I want you to think about this. That if you read your Bible to the book of Revelation, Revelation 21 will tell you that this is how it all ends. John said, I looked and behold, I saw a new Jerusalem, a new heavenly realm coming into the earth. And behold, the dwelling place of God is now with man on earth. 
as it is in heaven. Because see, when you're God, sin is not more powerful than your plan. So in Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter three did not change what God's going to do. It didn't change it because he's God. And so his goal, now think about this, his goal is to make earth look like heaven, but God is spiritual. And so he needs a physical representation of his image and his likeness to exercise his dominion over a physical planet. So he says, let's make man. And out of the dust of the ground, he made them. Male and female, he created them. And he said, let them be fruitful and multiply and subdue and take dominion. Now, how did they know how to take dominion? How, where did they get the authority and the power to take dominion? He breathed into their nostrils and they became living souls. So it was the spirit of God in the sons of God that connected them to the king so that they understood how to represent or recreate the kingdom in the earth. This is all in your Bible. And so here is God. And so God says, you know what? Create sons, put the spirit in them. Who can know the mind of God? Who can know the thoughts of God except the spirit of God? But we have the spirit of God. We have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ doesn't just quote scripture. It has a blueprint in it of what earth is supposed to look like. This is a good message. And so, and so now, now this is the Holy Spirit then is given to empower the sons of God to bring them to life. Oh, I thought the Holy Spirit was given to move you from the Baptist to the Pentecostal church. I thought that was their... <laughs> I thought it was about a denomination that when you needed to move a denomination, then you got the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit moved you in your denomination and you transferred your membership letter. <laughs> well, it got quiet. It is it got quiet in here. <laughs> I may have stepped on something holy. I wasn't trying. I wasn't trying to. I was just, oh, I thought the Spirit was given so you could speak in tongues. No, 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 no. The spirit was given so you could take dominion. That's, that's what the Holy Spirit. And so, so God then through the influence and the data connection, the ethernet cable of the Holy Spirit, then God could relate to man and man could take dominion over earth until earth looked like heaven. And so if you're the devil and you're looking for something to rule and reign over, because that was all you wanted to do. Anyway, I will ascend to the heights of the heavens. I will be like God. I will. Then you know the way, I, the way I hijack a planet is to sever the connection. And as soon as that connection is severed between man and the Holy Spirit or God and man, the connection is severed between heaven and earth. And then once that connection is severed in Genesis chapter three, the second law of thermodynamics is is initiated, which says as things move forward, entropy increases, meaning disorder and chaos increase as you move forward in time. And I would say like right after Genesis three, we have marital conflict. We have jealousy with Cain and Abel. We have conspiracy. We have hatred. We have murder. Then, then we have things like lack. Then we go on to sickness and death and sin. And it just keeps going until all of that, if you think about it, all those things kind of sound like today's morning paper. Right? 
Because heaven was supposed to be connected to earth and earth doesn't work without heaven. And then comes man's attempt to fix earth, to govern earth. And here's what Jesus is saying. It's not working. What you're doing is not working. No, 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 wait. If we start a religion, religion will fix the planet. No. Oh, really? What was the one group of people that could not get along with Jesus? Yeah. I think religion is the greatest enemy that exists to kingdom and the greatest threat because religion masquerades as kingdom, but without power. In fact, religion tries to meet the needs of people. If you think of Maslow's hierarchy, needs, a lot of religion was started to, to meet the needs of people. Now, before you're like, oh, he's anti-church and anti... No, 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 I'm not anti-anything. I'm pro-kingdom. Christianity is never supposed to be a religion. In fact, when you think in terms of religion, there are people that have been in religion their whole life and they can't tell you where they came from. And they can't tell you who they are and they can't tell you what they're called to and they can't tell you how they're going to do it. But if you change religion to kingdom, kingdom tells you where you came from. It tells you who you are. It tells you what you're called to and it tells you how to do it. Because religion doesn't, religion is another, who, think about this. I'm, who started Religion. Who started forms of governments? Amen. How's that working for us? Does it look like earth is leaning more towards entropy today? Yes. Right? And that's what Jesus is speaking to in Matthew 6. Like, look around. What you're doing's not working. Because think about it this way. If, if heaven and earth, so if earth was not created to exist apart from heaven... Neither were you. Your life will not work disconnected from heaven. Your life will not work disconnected from the kingdom of God. And that is what Jesus is saying in Matthew 6, He's like, hey, what you're doing doesn't work. It will never work. You can keep trying but it wasn't, that's not how it works because the earth can't work apart from heaven. Here's the second thing. Then we've got to get to the solution. Then what is the solution? So here's what Jesus is now saying in Matthew 6, 33. The kingdom is the solution to every problem. Yes. That's why he starts at these basic physiological needs. He's like, listen, Seek first, like, don't worry about food and clothes and don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. You know, don't worry about that. Well, but I should worry about those are important things. No, no, no. He's saying, no, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And these things will show up. And so he is saying, think about this. If you're sitting here saying, but these are real needs, these are real problems. I mean, we've had people die in, in the world today. People will die today because of hunger. People will die today because they don't have shoes and they get infections in their bodies. I mean, one of the ways you address the needs of humanity, believe it or not, is clean drinking water and foot coverings. Honestly, like when I trust it from, from a guy who was in missions for years, these are things you focus on. If I can get them clean drinking water, and I can cover their feet where they're not getting cut and they're not getting infected. Because without, you think about it in these third world countries, where are they going to get the antibiotics? Like we get an infection, you know, we step on a nail, we just run down to the ER and get a tetanus shot. They die. Right? So we got to cover feet. So, so what he's talking about, these are things, quite frankly, I think that are legitimate things to worry about if you're a worrier and even if you're not one. Right? He's like, you, you were worried. And he's like, no, 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 no. Because he's telling you a new way to live that works. Because he's saying, hey, if you worry about these things today, guess what's going to happen tomorrow? 
even if you provide today what you need, you got to do it again tomorrow. Right. And so what you worry about today, you're going to turn around and worry about again tomorrow. Right. How many have worried about something more than one day? <laughs> yeah. Right? And, and so when you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, just think about this, because I think he answers it all right here. Physiological needs. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, drink, and wear. What are you saying? Kingdom's the answer to that. What about needs of security, right? Ne needs of security, um, safety. All these things will be added. Don't worry. All these things will be added. So now you're saying physiological needs, covered. Security needs, covered. What about belonging? Your father, he tells us we belong. What about esteem, meaning who am I? Well, if he's a father, that tells me who I am. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. What about self-actualization? What is my purpose? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Like in this statement, he covers all the needs. He's like, listen, don't run after food and water and clothing. That's taken care of. Don't, don't run after the needs of security. Like he said, hey, the son of man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. He's not worried about that because he's in, because he's in the kingdom, right? And, and, and you start walking through this hierarchy of needs of belonging. Well, he's a father and who are you? Well, you're a son and what are you supposed to do with your life? Well, you're supposed to expand the rule of your father's kingdom into the earth. Like he, he answers the question, like if you want to know what the problem actually was, then we should look at what the solution is. Because Jesus shows up in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, and he starts what we would call his ministry. Now, before you get into ministry, being churchy and religious, understand that if we were not a, a, a democracy, if we were mon a monarchy, well, no, no, even in a democracy, we have, we have them here, they're called secretaries. But in a monarchy, they'd be called ministers. There's the prime minister and the minister of defense. Yes. What, what does that mean? Ministry means to administrate. When you minister, you administrate. So Jesus starts his administration. And what is he administrating? A kingdom in the earth. Because this is what he says. Matthew, Matthew 4, 17, he, said, he says this. He says, from this time on, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, Jesus just gave us a solution. So now if we know what the solution, because don't you think of God, the all, almighty creator of heaven and earth, and he sends his son. Notice Jesus' message wasn't repeat after me this prayer and you can go to heaven. Yeah. That wasn't his message. In fact, when, when we say gospel, the good news, a lot of times we relegate the good news of the gospel being you can die and go to heaven. Jesus never preached that message. Amen. Amen. Never even said that was the goal. Is it true? Technically, it's just incomplete. Right. Because that wasn't, the aim, the solution to your problem today is not that you can die and go to heaven. Yeah. Think about it. If that's all there is to the gospel, the gospel isn't even relevant to life on earth. It is only for after we die. So like good fire insurance, we say our prayer, we get our card and we wait till we show up at the morgue. But yet the message that Jesus preached seemed to be highly relevant to the world around him. Amen. The message he preached seemed to be powerful. The message he preached seemed to matter, not just in the afterlife, but in the present. Yes. The message that he preached made lame people walk and blind people see, and people say, where are the miracles? I'm like, I think we'll see the miracles when we get the message right. Yeah. 
Because when he preached, it says this. He said, hey, he went about saying, repent. Now, why say repent? Repent means change your mind. Now, think about this. Why would he say change your mind? Because he was talking to religious people. And he said, religion and kingdom don't go well together. And so he's like, repent. Why? And he said, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he, Jesus had his own mission statement, Luke 4.43. He said this. Jesus said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to these other towns also. For this reason, I was sent. Jesus, why did you come to earth? It looks like he would say, I need to go around and tell everybody that I'm going to die so they can go to heaven. But he said, no, 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 I've got to tell them the good news of the kingdom. What is the good news? That there's a kingdom here. Repent, for the kingdom is here. What is the good news? That the, I thought the good news was you can die and go to heaven. That's, that's okay news. I mean, it's definitely better than dying and going to hell. But there's a better news that Jesus said was the good news. And so Jesus' message was that there is something here that wasn't here before. There was something here that was lost in Genesis chapter three. And I came, yes, I'm gonna go to the cross and yes, I'm gonna die because I have to reconnect God with man, thus reconnecting heaven with earth. Because man fell from dominion so I have to restore man to dominion. That's right. That's right. But he was saying there's something here that hasn't been here in a long time. Yes. Let, let me illustrate the point. I want to introduce you to George. So this is George, also known as Jorge or Jorg. Okay, depending on which country you're from. And no, this is not a sign for the men's room. But, um, <laughs> but this is George. This is, this is George. Now, here's, now, I want to ask some questions now that you've met George. Has everybody met George? Have you met George? He's participating. You can wave at him. He can't, he can't see you, actually, but you can wave at him. Now, here's what I want to ask. is just serious questions. Um, am I more real or less real than George? More. More real. You are doing great. Dear God, I didn't know there was a test. <laughs> Get your purse, Ethel. Is this multiple gas? No, we're in COVID. Ethel, get your mask. Anyways, I'm sorry. I'm so wrong. Lord, I apologize. Anyways, um, so I am more real than George. Now, why am I more real than George? Because I am superior in the dimensions that I exist in. I'm in a superior dimension. He is in two-dimensional form, and I am in a greater dimension reality, thus a greater dimension yes. where I am three-dimensional. That's right. Does that make sense? So unfortunately, because he is less real than me, I can see him. Yeah. I can talk to him. Yes. I can stay near to him, but because he is less real, he can't see me That's right. and he can't naturally hear me. He can't naturally see me, and he might even think I'm not this close to him. That's right. Like he could go through something difficult and not even know that his creator was actually this close to him. That's right. He could make the mistake that what he sees is all there is to see. That's correct. And what he knows is all there is to know. That's right. Because it's all he's ever known. He doesn't even know there's another dimension that is superior and more powerful and greater and present. So when Jesus shows up, he shows up to tell a world full of Georges that there is something here. Let me say it. There is something in this room right now that is more real than you, yeah, yeah. that is more powerful than you. Yeah. Just because you can't see it naturally does not mean it is not there. That's correct. 
just because you can't hear it naturally doesn't mean it's less real or inferior to the reality that you are currently and presently experiencing. And so when Jesus shows up, he is looking at a bunch of Georges and he's saying, you got to change this. Because there's actually something here that you've been without so long and disconnected from so long, you no longer even know how to recognize it, to interact with it, to hear or to see or to understand. But this is the reason that I was sent. I came to bring a kingdom back to earth, the the realm of heaven that, that is given into earth, that controls earth, that manipulates earth, that guides earth, that recreates earth to look like it and that is what I brought with me by the spirit of God that is on me and if you just keep looking the same way if you just keep going to church and being religious you're going to miss the power and the presence of what is actually in that room with you Do you understand in this room is the health of a king, the power of a king, the freedom of a king, the salvation of a king, the peace of a king, the glory in this room, in your seat right now. You don't need someone to pray for you to be healed. Healing is in the room because the king is in the room. You don't need circumstance to change. You need to recognize the Prince of Peace is seated in your seat. Amen. Amen. So true. Don't make me work this hard. <laughs> so Jesus didn't come saying, I'm here to rescue all the men. And all the women, like I've got a big bus and we're going to get on it and we're going to fly away to heaven and then we're going to nuke the earth. It wasn't a rescue mission. No. It was a mission of colonization. Why, Why do you think... The, when, when, when Paul said to the Galatians, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth a son, born of a woman, born under the law, that she could redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Galatians 4, 17, all right? Why do you think it says the fullness of time had come? What was, what was so important about when Christ came? Because Christ came and he was born in Jerusalem when Jerusalem was under the rule of the Romans. The Roman Empire was the first empire to colonize territories as opposed to just capture and exile. So Rome would set up governors and they would change the money system and the culture, the dress, the values, And they would seek to colonize the territory as Rome, even though obviously Jerusalem was not in Rome. And Jesus comes. And when he's talking then about kingdom and a lot of the things that he says and a lot of the things that the apostle Paul would write, he is showing comparison to the understanding of kingdoms and colonization. Because what was earth originally? A colony of heaven. Was it going to be in the end? A colony of heaven. And so Jesus comes to say, hey, the king's back. And we're going to make this a colony. And, and, And then to that, he would say things like, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, you go. And make disciples, teaching them my commands, my culture, teaching them the kingdom. How are we going to do that, Jesus? Oh, how are we going to make that work? And you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Like this is what. God's trying to do. And so 
so Jesus looks at this group of people and he says, there are two systems present. A system of this world. When Jesus says, don't, you're not of the world, or did Paul say that? Anyways, you're in the world, but not of the world. So that's Paul. Um, he uses the word cosmos, which is rule or realm, not, not realm, sorry, rule or rulership. In other words, he's expressing you're not of this kingdom, even though you, back it up. You're not of Rome, even though you live in Rome. Right? He's saying, you're not of earth, even though you live there. That's why Paul kept saying, Be, you're citizens of heaven. Your citizenship is in heaven. You are citizens of heaven. You are colonizing earth. So, so you aren't called to be a religion. You're called to be an ambassador. Yes. Right. Didn't that what he said that we're ambassadors? Isn't that in your Bible somewhere? Yes. And so, and so Jesus now, so now Jesus is bringing this home and he's like, there are two Two worlds. So let's get to the third point so we understand how to work this out. And here's what he says. What you search for determines what you end up with. Because he's trying to tell us how to get the right thing. And in order to get the right thing, we have to pursue the right thing. And so he's like, there are two systems that are present. And this system over here says, worry about what you're going to eat and worry about what you're going to drink. This is the highest level of need Without this basic level, you can't move on. So this is, this is important. Worry about this. And then there's a kingdom saying, don't worry about that. Don't search for that. Because if you search for that, you could miss this. One of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes. My favorite C.S. Lewis quote is this. Aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Yes. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. Yes. Aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you'll get neither. And this is what Jesus say in Matthew chapter six. He's like, listen, listen, Linda, you're not listening to me. You're not listening to me, Linda. Linda, listen, Linda. You're not listening to me, Linda. If you haven't seen that video, it's so funny. <laughs> it's funny because it's not your kid. If it's your kid, you'd kill him. But because it's somebody else's kid, that's hilarious. <laughs> but here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, he's saying, this is the secret to simple, fulfilling, and meaningful life. The secret to what you end up with is determined by what you start out pursuing. Because if you aim at earth, you'll get nothing. But if you aim at heaven, you get all these things added. And then he says this, because this is so, I mean, you think about it. This, let's just be honest. This is not, I mean, this is easy to talk about. It's kind of fun to talk about, but it's not easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're going to go out of here and you're still going to have a bill due. And you're going to go out of here and you're still going to have a doctor's appointment. And you're going to go out of here and your kid's going to say that thing that sets you off. And you're going to go out of here and he's going to forget your anniversary again. <laughs> right? And you're going to go out of here and realize you got a meeting in the morning that you don't. And so this really is the struggle. Is this, can we just be real? This is the warfare. Yes. The warfare is over what you're going to, the, the warfare is over the pursuit. What you're going to pursue first. The warfare is really about the priority from which you're going to live and for which you're going to live. This is the warfare. And that's why Jesus in verse 30 says, you have little faith. Why? Because it takes faith to abandon that system and go with this one. Faith is actually seen in what you seek. It is. That's what he's saying. He's saying this. You have to, it takes faith to say, okay, I'm not going to worry about what I'm going to eat and where. 
That takes faith to abandon this system, even though, even though he tells you it won't work. Long term, it's not going to work. If you worry about these things today, you're just going to have to worry about them again tomorrow. Right? You get a bigger house, it just has a bigger payment. Right? You get a new car, it still has a time limit on the warranty. He's like, you keep worrying about that. You got to keep worrying about it. I got to show you something else. You got to, you got to live differently by changing. Seek first the kingdom. So he says, first of all, the, the, what's up for grabs, the method here through which things change is all about what you seek. But the, the principle here is the priority. Have you ever driven on the Indian Nation Turnpike at midnight and your gas gauge, your gas light came on? If you have, it's a lonely, dark stretch of road. And you're just convinced that this is where your life ends. 1 a.m., Indian Nation Turnpike, gaslight came on. Dear God. And you know what? You can't think about anything else. Here's why. Because what Jesus knows is if we're not careful, our greatest need, oh, our greatest need will become our greatest God. It's the, I'm going to say that again somewhere in this series. That's, because whatever is first has authority over the rest of your life. Your greatest need has the potential to become your greatest God. You don't believe me? Run out of gas on the Indian Nation Turnpike. You're not worried even about what you're going to wear or what you're going to eat. You just need some gas. And here's what he's saying. He's like, listen, here's where the battle is. Your greatest need is going to war for first. And you're going to be tempted to, to seek it first. And if you do that, you're going to be stuck in a lesser kingdom that doesn't have the power to actually meet that need. And you have to abandon that system and seek the kingdom first. Seek first the kingdom, the rulership, the realm that, that word kingdom, actually, it means to the government, the rulership, the will, the dominion, the influence, and the administration. So here's what he's saying. He's like, you have to abandon that, and you have to fight against your natural impulse to think that the thing you need most is most important. You have to fight against that to say, no, the thing I need most will be met when I seek what is most relevant and what is most real, which is the kingdom of God. Amen. And yes, it takes faith. And so I'm going to seek his government because ours ain't working, y'all. And I'm going to seek his rulership. And I'm going to seek your kingdom come. Your will be done. And I'm going to seek his influence and his administration, right? And then I'm going to seek his standard. His, 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 seek first the kingdom of God and his, and his righteousness. That word righteousness actually means legal corpus. In other words, his, his, God has a way that makes things right. He has a way that is right. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction. God has a way that is right. And so I'm going to seek what he says is right, and I'm going to seek his kingdom first. And when I abandon this system for that system, all these things, all these things. And so what does it mean to seek the kingdom first? Like you're sitting here, I want to seek the kingdom first. Well, one of the easiest ways to seek the kingdom first is prayer. In fact, the first thing Jesus tells you to pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he gets into daily bread and forgiving people. And, you know, here's a question you could ask yourself. It's a dangerous question. But if God were to answer your prayers from last week, would it have changed the world or just your world? Thank you. I worked on that. Right? And, and so kingdom says, well, we gotta, we got to pray. But, but when, when, when you look at Rome and what they did in Jerusalem and you look at the Bible and what heaven is supposed to do to earth, it's to recreate the culture of heaven on the earth. Well, what does the culture of heaven look like? Love. By this, they will know you're my disciples. Love. Like <laughs> one of my favorite stories from... Compassion Week 
And it was just one I happened to be there for, but this lady came through and, and we're just pumping gas, just helping people. And she said, uh, what's the catch? <laughs> I'm like her, cause I'd have been skeptical. Like, well, truthfully, I'd have just driven on past. I've been like, there's too many people out there. That's scary to me. And um, she came, what's the catch? I said, no catch. We just love you. Just want to be nice. Just do something kind. And this lady starts crying. And, and she says, this is the nicest thing that's happened to me in months. And as the story went, she had lost a loved one to COVID a few months before and life had just been hard. And so here's this picture. This is so awesome. I'm back here pumping gas. <laughs> Another person on our team's cleaning her windshield and a lady on the team's halfway up inside her SUV praying for her. What was that? Seeking first the kingdom because it was loving and, you know, a value. That, so the motive of the kingdom is love. You know, the value of the kingdom, serving. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to lay down my life, to give my life as a ransom for many. And, and if you think about it, and you know what the aim of the kingdom is? People, relationships. And, and you know what the principle of the kingdom is? Make disciples grow, grow. Healthy things grow, grow and things change. And, and, and do you know what the action of the kingdom is? Give. For God so loved the world that he gave. Give. And you know what happens when you, when you bring the kingdom, when you, when you put the motive and the value and by the way, we have five values here. You want to guess where they came from? Found people, find people, love. Save people, serve people, serve, right? Um, life happens in a group, relate. Healthy things grow, growing things change, grow discipleship. And then we are generous. We are stewards, we are generous, give. Because, because what I said is if we do these things, it's recreating the culture of heaven. It's bringing the culture of heaven into the earth. And you know what it produces? The atmosphere of heaven, which is peace. Amen. So Jesus said, he said, look, my peace I give you, my peace I live with you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. In other words, the world's peace is based on circumstance. Our peace is based on the Savior. It's a different system. This piece is constant. That piece can vary. Right. And then he said this, like when he sent the disciples out, they said, what are we supposed to do? He's like, you're going to bring the atmosphere of heaven. If you go into a town and they receive you, let your peace bring heaven. And if they reject you, just take your peace. But what are we supposed to do? Bring heaven. And so here Jesus says, here Jesus says, this world is full of only problems because it's disconnected from heaven. But the good news is I came to bring a kingdom and that kingdom has a solution for every problem. Here's the battle. Here's, here's the battle. You have to retrain yourself to seek first the kingdom. Amen. That is the kingdom solution. Yeah. Amen. Can you give Jesus praise, yeah. Yeah. Why don't you stand with me? Father, I thank you that the kingdom of God is in this room. God, that your power is in this room. That your presence is in this room. And God, I just pray, I, just, I feel this so strongly. God, I pray for healing, physical healing in bodies. God, because your kingdom is present. The Bible said Jesus went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all who were sick and oppressed of the enemy. God, the kingdom is here, so there is healing for the sick and deliverance for the oppressed. God, we speak healing into bodies in the name of Jesus. Whether they're online or in this room, God, we believe healing for people. 
for those who are sick, for those who are struggling in their body, and then deliverance for those who are oppressed of the enemy. God, depression has to go. Anxiety, go. Fear, go. Paranoia. I speak, I just feel very strong. I speak specifically to this feeling of gloom, dread, and, and everything's out to get me. This, this paranoia. And Lord, we just proclaim freedom to the captives because the kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God in this room with us is something more real, more powerful. God, it is the solution for every problem. With our heads bowed and no one's looking around. I just want to take an opportunity and ask anyone who needs a relationship with the King, whether you're watching online, don't, don't, don't log off, but watching or you're in the room. If you need a relationship with the King, I want to pray with you. If you're disconnected from God, I want to pray with you. And so if that's you, I want to give you an opportunity. I, I would never embarrass anyone or call anyone out. or we, would, we don't do that stuff. But if you're here, I want you, whether you're watching online or whether you're in this room, and you need to be reconnected to God. Then with no one looking around, I just want you to lift your hand up to God. And you're doing this for God, not for me. But I just want you to lift your hand up and say, God, here I am. I want to be reconnected with you. Even if you're in your living room by yourself, lift your hand. God, I want to be reconnected with you. And that's, that's you. You're just going to make this decoration. We call it a prayer, but it's really a decoration. It's just this. You say, God, I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe he died and rose again. I believe you came for me. And so, God, I ask you to forgive me and to make me a new creation, as your word says, and help me to live for you. And God, I pray as they pray that prayer, they make that declaration, God, that, that you would reveal yourself to them, that they would sense you, that they would know you, that you would lead them, God, that you would help them. And God, for all of us, Lord, the battle, the battle's gonna be abandoning one system for the other. It's gonna be about changing what we seek first. So God, I just pray you give us the grace to trust you more than things, more than stuff. God, help us to live for you, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Come on, can you give Jesus one more praise? Yeah. And then um, I want to ask our prayer team to come. If you're part of our prayer team, we end every worship experience with a time of prayer for anyone in his prayer for anything. We would love to pray with you if you lifted your hand. Also, if you're online, you can receive prayer by texting my pathway prayer to 77977. My pathway prayer to 77977. We'd love to pray with you if you need prayer, whether you're in the room or online. We love you. We'd love to pray with you. Everybody else said, but God bless you. We love you. Go and take over your world, and we will see you next weekend. God bless you. Hey, welcome to Pathway. Pastor Marty here, and I want to say how excited we are that you chose to join us online. It's incredible, and I want to encourage you now to stay connected with us. We don't want you to miss any of the content that we offer because we believe in connecting people to purpose, and we hope that everything that we offer will bring encouragement and hope and strength to you as you follow Jesus. Uh, there's a few ways you can stay connected. Number one is subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then click the notification bell. You'll get notified instantly whenever we offer new content Content. Also, you can like us on Facebook um, and you can follow us on Instagram. We were so excited to have you. I believe God has incredible plans for you. The best is ahead.